2 Timothy chapter 1. Are y'all there? It's harder to tell now that everybody's using their iPhone. <laughs> Used to could hear the pages turn. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul said this, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. Come on, shout, not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard against what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me and the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. See, this is important because what you believe about God defines your life. Can I, can I say it again? I want it to sink in. What you believe about God defines your life. That means if you believe something wrong about God, that's going to change the way you come to church. Like, for instance, I hear people say, well, you know, I want God to heal me and I believe that God is a healer. But if it's his will, if it's his will, he'll heal me. Because they'll say, they they like to dress it up, but make it sound theological. You know, God might be putting this on me to teach me something. Oh, good stinking grief. What a load of hogwash. See, this is what's wrong with the church. What you believe about God defines your life. If you believe that God puts sickness on you to teach you something, you're not going to stand in the inheritance that you've already got in Christ Jesus and say, cancer, I rebuke you right now. I wish the church could get mad at the right person. The Bible says it is the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundantly. God, don't put stuff on you to teach you nothing. My kid's wearing a cast on his leg because he decided it'd be a good idea to try to play soccer with some British boys. And Malachi's only half British, so the best I can tell, his American side took over for a few minutes. (laughs) And that did not work out very well. You know you're having a bad trip to the UK when you end up in the emergency room. First time a Georgia Bulldog blanket ever did make it into a hospital in the United Kingdom, I can tell you that. I have to boldly represent. I'm a football fan, can y'all tell? I feel like if I watch all those guys hit each other, I don't have to hit nobody. (laughs) Don't get mad at me because a few years ago when y'all went to the Super Bowl, I was pulling for y'all, the Cardinals, because I can't be bothered with no Steelers up in here. Come on. That was a great place to shout, and some of y'all missed it. See... I'm not going to get mad at the boys Malachi played soccer with. I'm going to get mad at the devil. Because I know what I preached that made the devil mad enough that we ended up under attack. (laughs) Everything's not the devil, but sometimes you need to be smart enough to play connect the dots and go, guess what? The thief just tried to steal and I'm calling it on it and he's got to cough it up and pay it back. But you know, speaking of football, I think football is about the best illustration of the scripture we just read. American football, honey. Sorry. Just deal with it. We're back in the States. We watch two kinds of football in this marriage, and that's how we have a happy marriage. But when the quarterback throws the football to the wide receiver, the wide receiver has to hold it closely, retain the standard of sound words. Right? Right? But how many know if he's going to score, he better get that hand out. He's got to guard because there's about 11 other gorillas coming after him. And if he's going to make it to the end zone, he's going to get that hand out and block while he holds on. Retain the standard of sound words and you better guard them through the Holy Ghost. I don't know if y'all have noticed or not, but these are the last of the last days. And the government and the culture in the United States is trying to dictate to us what we're allowed to believe about God. But what you believe about God defines your life. I know in whom I have believed. 
And I don't have the right to edit the Bible to make you feel better. Excuse me, church. We don't have the right to be politically correct. There's such a spirit of confusion in this nation right now that my God have mercy. They don't even know what bathroom to go to. What you believe about God defines your life. And you have to know what you believe because we are in this this era where everything apparently is on the table for the culture to decide what is okay for us to believe. It's no longer acceptable to say that homosexuality is not just sin. It's an abomination and God hates it. Hey, if you're in the room and you've been struggling with that, I came to tell you my Jesus can set you so free. And he loves you. But it's still an abomination and I can't change that to make you feel better. What you believe about God defines your life. Don't everybody shout at the same time. There's just some stuff that's not for sale. I I was on the internet the other day. How many know there are some very stupid people on the internet? (laughs) Don't look at your neighbor. Just look at me. I don't want lunch to be weird for you. Just look this way. But I was on Twitter, which seems to be where all the very angry people go. (laughs) If you have an anger management problem, you definitely have a Twitter account. (laughs) And so this guy that has been popular in Christian music, and I won't call his name because I'm in a pretty good mood. Um, I got my hot sauce and my coffee this morning. I'm good. But this guy gets on Twitter and he starts, you know, mouthing off. Yes, I rolled my eyes. You can too. You're going to get mad too. He gets up there and says, you know, if all you have to sing about is the blood of Jesus and what happened on the cross, then you really need to look around in this world and see that the cross can mean so much more in our culture. He said the very idea that a father would sacrifice and brutally murder his son is horrific. And we need to move past this. I nearly threw my phone through the wall. We need to move past this? What on earth? The arrogance to think. This is why, this is why local churches have to host evangelists from time to time. Because when the church becomes unfamiliar with the fundamental truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we start thinking that you can mature past the cross. It ain't never going to happen, baby. Get over it. I know it was the blood that set me free. I know it was the blood that changed my life, that raised me from spiritual death to eternal life. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. This is why his gospel, let me tell you, that guy has a powerless gospel because he has removed the blood. You ain't going to catch this worship leader singing any of his songs. Forget it. You think the cross was horrific? Let me tell you something, baby. My sin was horrific, but my Savior is magnificent. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I know, I know the one in whom I have believed. You're not talking me out of it. I've seen too much. And you better believe I'm dangerous. Are there any dangerous people in here this morning? Number one, the God I serve is the chain breaker. 
See, these are some of the truths that are not for sale. I came to tell you this morning, if you've got addiction in your life and nobody knows you've been popping pills in the dark at home when the whole house is asleep, if you have been addicted to pornography, whatever the chains in your life have been, even if it's just the fear of man and you think that's a little more sanitary. I don't care what chains you came in with this morning. The God I serve is the chain breaker. He's not intimidated by your bondage. When he walks in the room, the chains fall off. Oh, hallelujah. He is the chain breaker. Growing up, I thought it was normal. We grew up, I grew up in Augusta on the wrong side of town. We lived in a crack neighborhood. So like it was normal to come out of the house, to get in the car to go to church and say hello to the prostitutes. How y'all doing? (laughs) Have a nice day. (laughs) And go on to church. It was normal. Saw people, but there was a crack house a couple of blocks away. And I remember watching as cars would come by, place their order out the window, drive around the block and then pick it up. I'm like, it's a drive through crack house. Where's the cops at? They think it's McDonald's for cocaine. Where are the cops at? So I grew up in a bad neighborhood. I thought it was normal. The church was two blocks away. I thought it was normal for everybody's granddaddy. My granddaddy was my pastor. If y'all think I'm fun, you wouldn't even be able to handle him. I thought it was normal for alcoholics to come into the church and granddaddy pray for them. And they totally get saved, sobered up. And before it's over, they're talking in tongues. I didn't know. I didn't know there was such a thing as white church. I had no idea. I thought I was black. I grew up with foreign reaches to the highest mountain. And it flows to the lowest valley. Yeah, clumsy people are going to kill that thing. It's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never it's power. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Come on, come on, come on, come on. White people don't write songs like that. I'm just an inverted Oreo. The black's on the inside. Y'all grew up listening to Don Moen. I grew up with the West Angeles Church of God in Christ, baby. I remember hearing some white church, God bless them. They're going, what a mighty God we serve. I was like, mom, are they serious right now? Because we were, what a mighty God we serve. I mean, I just didn't know. I'm so worried about the first time visitors right now. (laughs) Please give this church another chance. (laughs) Jesus help us. He's the chain breaker. But watch this. Sometimes the chains you walk into this church with are not about a sin issue in your life. Sometimes you can end up in chains because of something you did that was right. Anybody been walking with God for more than 10 minutes? Because there were these three boys in the book of Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, they end up in Babylon, not because they had moved, because it was going to be a great career opportunity. Sometimes we sanitize these stories trying to make them all cute. No, these boys were kidnapped. Their parents were murdered in front of them. They were relocated to Babylon to serve under a king who was so crazy, he could have hid his own Easter eggs and still been surprised. (laughs) 
Have y'all read the Bible lately? (laughs) Nebuchadnezzar was a total psycho. This guy has a dream just in like the first couple of chapters, tells his wise men, I want y'all to tell me the dream. They said, okay, I want you to interpret the dream. He, they said, sure, tell us what your dream was. He said, I'm not going to do that. I want you to tell me the dream and the interpretation. They said, we can't really do that. And he said, then you can all be dead then. How many know that's not normal? Some of y'all are still mad about the election. I'm telling you, you still got a better deal than Nebuchadnezzar. Just saying. Just saying. I think they're all crazy now, but on a bad day, none of them are as bad as Nebuchadnezzar. This guy sets up a statue, 90 feet tall, tells everybody we're going to fire up the worship team. How many know the devil's got one? Okay. And he says, when the band plays, you're going to hit the deck. You're going to bow down. And if you don't, I've got a furnace with your name on it. How many have ever heard of the threat of hell? You know the story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't bow. They stand when everybody else bows. That, you know, we all know the end of the story, so we think, isn't that great? What a wonderful witness for Jesus. Y'all, Nebuchadnezzar didn't pat him on the back and say, come on, boys, let's go get some fried chicken. Is that okay in the Southwest? I'm sorry, I went Georgia on y'all. Tacos. With jalapenos up in there. Come on. Glory a Dios. (laughs) Caliente. I am spicy. Come on. No, he didn't. He didn't pat them on the back and thank them for their wonderful witness for Jesus. He follows through. He wraps their life in chains. He stands them in front of him and says, guess what? I'm giving you one more chance. And if you don't bow, you're going in this furnace. This is what the word of God says in Daniel chapter three, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and he will deliver us, O king. But even if he does not, Is there any of that in Arizona this morning? Even if he doesn't. Let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. See, when you read that passage, you can mistake this really, really easily. You can think that that's where they made the decision. But the truth is, back when they first landed in Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with their buddy Daniel, had made a worship decision. Babylon means confusion. Those boys had decided right there at the beginning of this whole thing, we might live in Babylon, but Babylon is not going to live in us. We're not bowing down to this demonic culture. We're not bowing down to this spirit of confusion that keeps people from knowing what gender they are. We're not bowing down. We're not bowing down. Nebuchadnezzar wraps them in chains, throws them in the fiery furnace. How many have ever had hell follow through on a threat? He ain't playing with you, honey. This is for keeps. But this is what the word of God says. And oh my word, I love this. Verse 23, but these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. As far as they know, they're not getting delivered. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and he stood up in haste and he said to the high officials, was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king. And he said, look, I see four men loose. Come on, shout loosed. 
Come on, do it again. Loosed. I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of God. Oh, my God knows how to break the chains. You might go into the furnace, but let me tell you, if you're here this morning and you've been under a demonic attack from hell and the devil has followed through on his threat and thrown you in chains into a fire that's already been heated up seven times hotter and you don't know how you're getting out of this. Let me tell you what you do when you land in that fire. You take a walk. You take a walk in the fire with the one who said of himself, I am a consuming fire. And what's going to happen is as you're walking about in those flames, you're going to find that Jesus is walking right there with you. And every chain that the devil put on your life is going to go up in smoke. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. He's the chain breaker. And he breaks every chain. Hey! I felt that James Brown thing get on me too. Wow! <laughs> See, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was going to cut those boys' purpose short. Here's what God said about himself. You ready? The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, just as I have intended, so it has happened. And as I have planned, so it will stand. The devil can't cut your purpose short, baby. And God's not going to do it. So if if your destiny has not happened, it's you. Mm, I'm glad I'm hiding behind the pulpit. Don't get mad at me. I just read it to you. Okay, well, we'll just keep going because y'all didn't like that part. (laughs) My God is the chain breaker and he breaks every chain. He's not intimidated by what you came in here with. He already knew. You don't even, you know, you look good this morning. All churchy and everything, but it's not like you had God fooled in the first place. You might as well just let him set you free. Dignity is so overrated. When Malachi was born, he got the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. The devil tried to kill him. Um, It didn't work. (laughs) But (laughs) that's another story for another day. But the nurses started screaming non-reassuring, which apparently was an invitation for the whole city of Orlando to come watch me give birth. And I'm the most modest person I know. They were very concerned they were going to have to take me into emergency surgery. It was fine. God worked it out and it was fine. The point is, birthing is nothing to do with dignity, baby. Whatever pride you got, it goes. Because at the very least of it all, you're wearing one of those gowns that has never been clothing. Y'all know what I'm talking about. All the mamas know what I'm talking about. Just lose your dignity. It'll be so much more fun today and tonight. Just lose it. Number two. Is that right? Number two? I really have no business using numbers. I'm too sanguine to hold that still, but. Number two. The God I serve is the gate unlocker. Now, I said that really cute and nice, but it's more like he blows them up. See, we, as we travel, we get to go some crazy places, but we don't often get to do any sightseeing because we're busy rolling around in the carpet with you. (laughs) But we went to the Netherlands. First time we went to the Netherlands, it was, it was amazing. Um, (laughs) I made some people really mad there, Pastor, but we'll talk about that later. But anyway, you you know, you can find religious folk anywhere on this planet. I have learned. And they all go, when you start bringing the Holy Ghost up into stuff. Anyway, another deal for another day. But we got to do a little bit of sightseeing this one day. And they took us to the city gates of the old town. Y'all know that everything in Europe is like a million years older than our whole country. Right? 
So these were literal walls that encompassed the old city. And Nathan and I got out and took pictures in the gates of the city. They got the little towers where there's the archers are shooting people. I was going, man, this is a little too real for me. We stood right there in the gates of the city. Let me tell you why this matters. In the Bible times, in, in Hebrew culture and in the surrounding cultures, the gate of the city was the seat of authority. Can we have a little nerd power moment? I know a lot of folk wear these glasses because they're hipster. I wear them because I am a nerd. Nerd power, here we go. The gate of the city was the seat of authority. It was like going to city hall. If you needed a judgment from the court, you went to the gate of the city. Are y'all, are y'all bored yet? Do we need coffee? I can't tell. If you needed, if you wanted to get married, you went to the gate of the city. If you wanted to buy property, you went to the, okay, let me give you some examples. Okay. When Abraham needed to buy property to bury Sarah, his wife, he made that transaction at the gate of the city. When Ruth was about to be redeemed by Boaz, which means that he didn't just marry her, he bought the property of her dead husband and was committed to raising up children for that man's inheritance. That entire transaction happened at the gate of the city. You want one more? When Nebuchadnezzar decided to take over the kingdom of Judah, he did that. He took over the entire nation of Judah by setting his throne down at the seat of authority, at the gate of the city in the city of Jerusalem, because it was the capital city. The gate of the city is the seat of authority. And I came to tell you, see, the thing of it is, okay, when the gates were open, you could come and go and do business. You were welcome. When the gate was shut, you better not come up in here. Because if you came in when the gates had been shut on you, that's called an invasion. And an invasion is an act of war. Right? Here we stand in my home nation where for years now we have tried to shut God out. We've closed the gates in God's face as if that's going to keep him out. I got news for y'all. God is invading. Like it or not, invite him or not, vote for him or don't, but he's coming and he's not coming to play patty cake. He's coming to take over. Now there's a, there's a story in the Bible that I had heard all my life. I've read it a million times and I never grabbed it because we're so Western. The Gates thing, it just didn't click for me. Something about seeing it in person made me connect the dots and go, oh, I've never seen it before. There's this guy in the book of Judges named Samson. I know what I'm about to say and I'm a little worried about you. So I'm smiling real pretty so you won't get mad at me. So, see, when I say Samson, y'all think of this 400 pound, incredible Hulk, ripped dude, right? Okay, you can admit it, come on. When they did that Bible series, they got a guy that looked like the size of King Kong. Here's the problem with that. If he looks like that, why is anybody saying, what is the secret of his strength? Right? If he's 400 pounds and ripped, the secret of his strength is not a mystery, Pastor. It is steroids. Come on, y'all. There's no way he was that big or nobody would even be asking the question. But if he looks like Barney Fife <laughs> with dreadlocks, come on. Steve Urkel, did I do that? Come on, y'all. If he looks like a toothpick and all of a sudden Barney Fife picks up the jawbone of a donkey and opens up a can of whoop butt on a thousand warriors, well, now we got us a ball game. And everybody says, what is the secret of that guy's strength? I don't 
don't think he was 400 pounds and ribbed. I think he looked like a toothpick with legs. And Samson was a guy that was a Nazarite to God. He lived a vow of extreme holiness and the spirit of the Lord would come on Samson. I think he had no strength whatsoever outside that phrase. The spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. But when the Holy Ghost would come on him, he would go absolutely crazy and win incredible battles for God all by himself. There's still enough kids in the room that I'm going to say this nicely because... Being a parent now, I don't want any of y'all to have to have weird conversations on the way home. But Samson had a problem. Samson had difficulty knowing which bed he was supposed to sleep in. Mm. It's in the Bible. If y'all would read the Bible, you could cancel your subscription to Netflix. So he found himself in the wrong bed. We're just going to say it like that. But even though he was in the wrong bed, by the way, you can't get away with that. His life ended up getting cut short for that. So don't y'all try that. But he was in the wrong place. He was in enemy territory in a Philistine city called Gaza. (laughs) But God still used him because God was trying to show you something about these gates. Judges chapter 16, you can turn there if you want, you don't have to, it's up to you. Judges chapter 16, when I saw this in light of what the gates really meant, this absolutely blew my mind. The Bible says in verse two, when it was told to the Gazites saying, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. Okay, y'all, what does surrounded mean? It ain't no way out, right? Okay. They surrounded him, lying wait for him all night at the gate of the city. And they kept silent all night saying, let us wait until the morning light and then we will kill him. Now Samson lay until midnight and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the city gate and the two posts and pulled them up along with the bars. Then he put them on his shoulders and carried them up to the top of the mountain, which is opposite Hebron. My God, have mercy. I'd never seen it before. Y'all think Marvel Comics is cool? This is about to blow your face off. Those guys had him surrounded. No way out. Swords drawn and they're standing there going, when he come out here, we gonna kill him. They were ready. They were waiting. As far as they were concerned, Samson was their version of Osama bin Laden. He had been terrorizing them. They were eager. They didn't fall down on the job. And the Bible does not say that they like fell asleep and that's how he got through. They had him surrounded. But he got up and he walked right through them. Come on, y'all. They don't hear that. They don't see that. This is all happening at midnight. Come on, it's not rocket science. There's no electricity, so there's no street lights. So he walks straight up to the gate of the city. This is in the dark, but they had been waiting for him. He walks up to the gates of the city, rips those gates right off the hinges. They don't hear that. They don't see that. What kind of noise would it make if you took a 30-foot door off a hinge? with your own bare strength. And then Barney puts those gates up on his shoulder. You're never gonna see Samson the same. I've ruined Samson forever. He put those doors up on his shoulders. Why? Because Isaiah said of Jesus Christ that the government, come on, the gate of the city was the seat of authority. The government would be upon his shoulders. And it wasn't enough to just take the gates off. He walked it back up into the territory of Judah. Hebron was David's city in Judah. Come on, somebody. I came to say to the territory takers this morning, it's about time you get ready because God is invading and he's about to put the power back where it belongs. Gone are 
are the days of the powerless church. The church of Jesus Christ is rising up with power, with authority, with signs, wonders, and miracles. He opens up the gates. Could it be? And those idiots still stand there with their swords drawn. When he comes out here, we're going to kill him. <laughs> That's why I don't have time to be impressed with the devil. Can I tell you something, church? Some of y'all, I love it. We go, we go places and people come up and like, the devil's been on my back. We had an old lady at my daddy's church and she said, the devil's been on my back all week, bless his holy name. <laughs> We were like, mm, no, nah, that wasn't quite right. <laughs> Some of y'all have been to that testimony service. <laughs> but could it be that maybe, just maybe, the devil that you are so impressed with is just not that cool? Could it, let me tell you about the devil that you're so worried about. He's got brain damage. The Bible says that Jesus, the son of God, crushed the head of that serpent. The devil's nothing more than a brain damaged demon that doesn't have sense enough to know that he has already been defeated. God is coming through the gates. He's putting the power back in the church. Oh, hallelujah. That's why the psalmist David said, lift up your head, all ye gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors. Why? Because the king of glory is coming. He is the Lord, strong and mighty in battle. Ready or not, he's coming. Oh, I've got news for every politician trying to block him out. I've got news for every spirit of darkness that's trying to make us bow down to the culture. You better get ready because the God we serve is coming loud and proud. He's not backing off. He's not intimidated. He's the King of glory, the Lord Almighty, and he's coming. I don't have time to be impressed with the devil. My, 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 my. Are y'all okay? Are you having fun yet? Are you bored? Good. The God I serve is the way maker. (laughs) See, He makes a way. I love this phrase. I say this to myself all the time. Because God is always on time for us. But sometimes he makes us sweat. God makes a way where there seems to be no way. Just because you think there's no way. Just because you have no logistics for your current situation. That does not mean that there ain't a way. If you ain't got a way, God will make one. He is still the creator. He has never stopped creating. That's why we go around our house singing, we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Yeah, y'all got to go get that. You're going to like that. That is who you are. He's good at this. You know, one of the biggest revelations about God that I've ever had in my whole life was this. God is really good at being God. (laughs) Me, not so much. I've noticed that every single time I try to help him, it does not work out. How many of you tried to help God and blew up in your face? Come on, somebody. (laughs) Thank you to the people who did not just lie in church. See, Moses had just been used of God to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. And they walk out after 430 years of slavery. And now they're standing at the Red Sea and they were having one of those Holy Ghost church services. You know, the ones with the tambourines. 
I'm going to help you, Jessica. I'm going to say something that you have never been able to say. I'm going to make your life easier right now in this whole church. You ready? If you're in the room and you are Caucasian, put the tambourine down. Those are not for you. Those are for our black brothers and sisters. And it's all because your mama can't dance and your daddy don't rock and roll. (laughs) Pastor, you can fix this next week. I don't even know, man. I'm so scared. I'm not getting any lunch, y'all. This is getting bad. But they were having one of those Holy Ghost services, celebrating their newfound freedom. And they're right in front of the water. And all of a sudden, a shock wave goes through the whole nation. They begin to hear the ground rumble. Look behind them and see the dust in that desert start to rise up. Come on, Arizona. I've been through a dust storm with y'all before. That was epic. (laughs) I'm used to hurricanes. I didn't know what in the world was going on. All of a sudden, Egypt is coming back. Come on, in the best case scenario, they're going back into slavery. Worst case scenario, Pharaoh's done with the Jewish problem and he's going to kill them all. Not a good day. This is what the Bible says. See, there's no way out to the right or the left. They're standing in front of the water and the greatest superpower of their day is bearing down on them. And in Exodus chapter 14, verse 21, this is what the Bible says. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land so that the waters were divided. The sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land. This was not mud puddles. I don't care what the Ten Commandments movie showed you. No mud puddles. It was like walking out on I-10. Come on. Walked through the midst of the sea on dry land and the waters were like a wall to them on their right and on their left. The God I serve is the way maker. I don't care. If you don't think you got a way out, you're in a good place, boo-boo, because God's getting ready to show up and show off in your life. They didn't just... They didn't just walk through on dry land. The Bible says, if you read the book of Exodus, the Bible says that God told Israel, before you leave, go and borrow from all the Egyptians their rich people stuff. It's in the Bible. When you watch movies like the Ten Commandments and they show you people on crutches and tattered rags and bandages, that's a bunch of junk right there. Because the Bible says that every single person in Israel was healed and whole, not a sick person among them. And they walked out having plundered Egypt. Come on, with their diamond Rolexes and their Armani suits, a couple of iPads strapped to them, come on. They plundered because that, was, that wasn't just so they could say they got rich. It was payback for 400 years of free labor. The God we serve walked those people out with the riches of the greatest superpower of the day. Walked them out on an interstate that wasn't there five minutes ago with the coolest aquariums in the history of the world on their right and on their left because the God I serve is the way maker. Oh, hallelujah. The Lord said... The Lord keeps speaking this to me the whole time we've been here. What the Lord is about to do in this church is going to be both perpetual and irrevocable. But it will not be containable. And I keep seeing the walls. And I'm sorry, Pastor, these walls, not that one, these walls collapsing under the power of God. Because what God's about to do in this house, you don't have any logistics for. But God's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. You better get ready. I see people in Arizona that wouldn't know God if he walked in with a big red hat on coming and giving y'all big money because what's going to happen in this church is going to be carried.
financially by people that don't even know God. Behold, I do a new thing. Even now it springs forth. Will you not perceive it? Perpetual and irrevocable. Perpetual and irrevocable. This is why I believe that. Because, now some of y'all are going to get mad at me. If you'll just hold on, I'm going to prove it, okay? God is not logical. He is supernatural. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What if we believe it? <laughs> you sang it real cute. But what if you believe it? He is not logical. He never bows himself down to the wisdom of man. He's not impressed with your good idea. He is not logical. He is supernatural. What do I mean? Well, you know. Oh, sit down. You're going to be okay. We're going to get up and scream again in a minute. Don't worry. You know you're having a good day at church when your watch thinks you're getting a great workout. <laughs> Burning some calories up in here. Wow. When we go to heaven, I hope God lets us see the movies of stuff. Don't y'all? I mean, for one thing, popcorn in heaven is going to rock. Because the Bible says every good and perfect gift. Come on, come on. It comes from above. I'm just saying. But I want to see, of course I want to see Joshua and the battle of Jericho. But I don't want to just see that part. I want to see the part where he had that prayer meeting with the captain of the host. You remember that? Y'all know the captain of the host is Jesus, right? <laughs> he comes out of that prayer meeting. And I want to see the part where he told his commanders of his army this thing that he had the audacity to call a battle plan. God is not logical. He is supernatural. I want to see when he looked at them and said, so here's what we're going to do. <laughs> do y'all read the Bible sometimes? I think I have more fun when I read the Bible than you do. <laughs> I want to see when he said, what we're going to do is we're going to walk around the wall. <laughs> In total silence. Come on, girls, that's where we'd have messed up. <laughs> I'd have been out on lap one, y'all know. Come on. All y'all husbands don't need to be saying amen out there right now. I'm watching you. <laughs> don't mess with me. I got pregnancy hormones going on up in here. You, you don't want none of this. We're going to walk around the wall once a day in silence. Okay. <laughs> then what are we going to do? Oh, we're going to do that for six days. <laughs> and on the seventh day, we're going to do it seven times. And the priests are going to blow the trumpet. Da -da 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 -da. And then the whole nation is going to go. Ah! That's the plan. That's the whole plan. No plan B. Y'all, he's looking at a wall that he can't see the top of because it's so high. It's wide enough they're running chariot races on it. And he wants to walk around a wall and yell at it. <laughs> My kids too, so we watch a lot of Veggie Tales. And all I can see when I preach that part is those little French peas. Keep walking, but you won't knock down our wall. <laughs> God is not logical. He is supernatural. What about Gideon? That's another good one. What 
a crazy plan he had. First of all, Gideon was a total chicken. God had to really talk him into having any kind of courage at all. But when Gideon finally got over himself and he had his prayer meeting, he comes out with a plan. He's got 300 rednecks. This is my sermon. I'll preach it like I want to. In my movie of this, they all look like Phil Robertson. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. In my mental image, and Uncle Si with his cup of tea. Come on. And he says, I've got a plan. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take some clay pots. Y'all, the army of Midian, the Bible says they were like locusts without number. And Gideon wants some clay pots. The man's talking about pottery. (laughs) What are we going to do with the pots? Well, we're going to put a torch in there. And when I say go... We're going to smash the pots. Now, y'all, I'm not some brilliant strategic chess playing thinker, but how many know if you have 300 rednecks and an army that nobody can number, what you don't want to do is make a loud noise and light up your position so the enemy can shoot you. Not a good idea. We're going to... When I say go, we're going to smash the pots, light the torches. We're going to blow the trumpets. Oh, come on, y'all. God likes those trumpets. Da, 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 da. And we're going to all scream a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. What the heck does that mean? And what I love about God is not with Joshua or with Gideon. Did he explain himself? God's got this crazy idea. He thinks he's God. He doesn't think he owes us an explanation. You better get ready because there may come a day when your pastor walks in here with what you think sounds like a ridiculous word of the Lord, but everything hinges on your obedience to the ridiculous word of the Lord. It could be that God uses something that offends your logistics to demonstrate that he is the way maker and he makes a way where there seems to be no way. This is how I fight my battles. How about Jehoshaphat? We're going to give him a battle plan. Oh yeah, this is a good one. Send the worship team first. Thank you. (laughs) Got a target on our back. What did we ever do to you? Just because we didn't sing the song you liked. Really? The commentaries say (laughs) that Judah was outnumbered eight to one. Three nations had come together to to bring an end to the nation that was named after praise. I know y'all think you're of the tribe of Levi. You're not. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hello, praise. That's whether you sound like Whitney Houston or one of those people up on the X Factor that their mama never did tell them. Don't look at your neighbor. I'm telling you, don't do it. Resist the urge. But because Jehoshaphat followed the ridiculous word of the Lord and made a bunch of guys go out singing for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. The place where praise was supposed to die ended up becoming known as the Valley of Blessing. And they picked up the devil's riches for three days. It's one thing when you give God an offering, but it's another whole matter when he gives you one. Mm. He is the way maker. What he's about to do in here is higher than your logistics. Man, I feel that. Somebody just say, yes, Lord. We receive it. We don't know what it means but we want it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We want it, Lord. 
Y'all got five more minutes? Am I preaching too long? Is it okay? Okay, pastor said I'm doing good, so I don't really care what y'all think. Um, (laughs) The God I serve is the door opener. (laughs) He opens the doors that no man can shut. (laughs) And he's good at it. Now, there's a scripture in the book of Acts. I want you to turn there. I want you to see this. Acts chapter 12. See, Herod had just killed James, just beheaded him. And he got such a great public relations response from that, that he arrested Peter too and threw him in jail. Do y'all remember that? Acts chapter 12. This is going to be, this is going to be fun. Oh my goodness. The Bible says in verse six, on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. That's a lot of hardware for a guy that's just a fisherman. Right? But somewhere around Acts chapter four-ish, the Lord had already busted a bunch of the apostles out of jail, so Herod knew these guys are hard to hang on to. Right? Okay, I'm just saying. Verse seven, and behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter's side and woke him up saying, get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Now, hold on just a minute. Cause for all of y'all that like to live out there with the Care Bears and the Smurfs, <laughs> I can't stand weird stuff, man. If God's doing something real, I am all in. I will jump in with both feet, but Oh, good grief. I remember in Brownsville one time, some insulation fell out of some of the speakers. And a lady brought me 11 pages of stuff she pulled off the internet of angel feathers. I was like, okay, first of all, that was speaker insulation. (laughs) Second of all, I'm pretty sure angels are not molting in the church. We had a crazy lady at my daddy's church. Uh, I'm sure there are no crazy people here this morning, but (laughs) my dad said there was a light on the top of our church building that only the crazy people could see because we definitely had more than our share. Um, If you're watching online, I love you. (laughs) Anyway, but this one crazy lady, she used to tell people she had a, a chair in her living room that was Barney the dinosaur purple. That's how you know this is not gonna be a good story. Not a great idea. And she said that every single day, the angel Sarah would come and sit in that chair and have tea with her and teach her things. I was like, okay, but first of all, there are no chick angels in the Bible. All the feminists just got mad right there. Don't get mad at me. I didn't write the Bible. There are no girl angels in the Bible. Second of all, when any of the real angels showed up in the Bible, they usually had to pick somebody up off the floor and say, I didn't come to kill you. I just have a word from God for you. And you think you're having tea. In your Barney the dinosaur purple chair. Okay. I think you're smoking weed, man. (laughs) Oh man, I just said that out loud. (laughs) I didn't get enough revival juice this morning. But I looked it up. When it says that the angel of the Lord came in and he struck Peter's side, that was not a real cute little wakey, wakey, rise and shout, it's time to get up. The word that is used in the Greek is the same word for when they beat Jesus before they sent him to the cross. Y'all, you want an experience with an angel? Are you sure? The angel of the Lord showed up in that cell and punched Peter out. How many know that's called a rude awakening? Mm -mm -mm. (laughs) Mm-mm-mm. And the angel said to him, gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow and he did not know. I love the Bible. It's so cool, isn't it? He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. What on earth was Peter's prayer life like? 
if he thought being punched by an angel and broke out of jail was another day in the neighborhood. (laughs) Do y'all think about that? What? When they passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out along one street and immediately the angel departed from him. See, you've got to remember if God, can I, can, I, I like to watch dead people on YouTube, dead pastors, because they can't backslide, right? <laughs> and some of the new ones are crazy, so I like to watch the dead guys. I like to watch Bishop Gilbert Patterson. He's not white, that's why y'all don't know who he is. And he just said it like this. If he woke you up, it's to walk you out. Mm. For all y'all white people, that was the God of angel armies. is always by my side. Man, I hope I don't mess your church up too bad. I'm, I'm so not going to look at you anymore, Pastor. I'm coming back up here. See, the problem with everything I just read you is this. Peter did not pray for God to bust him out of that jail cell. Can we say it like this? He was not expecting God to walk him out of there. You ever come to church and heard somebody get up and tell you, well, if you're not expecting from God, you're not going to receive anything. I came to tell you that God is way nicer than that. He wants to set up the jailbreak that you stopped praying for. He wants to get involved in the prayers that you stopped praying. He wants to minister to the things that you don't even believe he can do anymore. He's way nicer way nicer than that. You know, you know what? It's a good idea to go ahead and expect the unexpected, but there are some things that God wants to do in your life in your family's life and in this church that you don't have a way to put your expectation on. The word of God says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God's going to do for his children. Now unto him. Nathan read it last night. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above and beyond all you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Listen, expect it or not, you're about to get the doors open in your life. You remember... In 2 Kings, somewhere around chapter 4, the Shunammite woman builds an upper room for Elisha the prophet. She wants to minister to the prophet. She sets aside a chamber for him. The Bible talks about she and her husband being wealthy, but they were barren. Somebody has a problem with their fallopian tubes and you've been unable to, unable to conceive and the Lord says you're going to be healed in Jesus' name. Who's that? Who's that? Please don't be embarrassed. If that's you, please raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you, but the Lord, I'm telling you, barren, this runs in my family, but I'm 17 weeks pregnant with my second. We'll find you in a minute. Maybe you're watching online. I rebuke barrenness in the name of Jesus. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus. When God comes into the room, he naturally produces life. Whew. But that woman was barren, even though she had wealth and even though she knew how to recognize the man of God, the anointing of God, when she saw it, she was barren. And Elisha said, we want to be nice to you. We want to bless you back for the way you've taken care of us. So this time next year, you're going to receive a son. The Bible says her husband was old. That means she wasn't about to get no kid unless God got involved. Are y'all Okay. She didn't respond in expectation or faith. She said, no, man of God, don't you lie to me. Don't you get my hopes up. I gave up on this a long time ago. 
but because God is good. <laughs> he fulfilled that word whether or not she believed it or expected it. God is the door opener and he's about to open up the doors. <laughs> Isaiah twenty two twenty two says, then I will set upon him the key of David. And what he opens, no man will shut. And what he shuts, no man will open. In case you want to know about what that was ultimately, who that was ultimately referring to, Jesus pulls it over to Revelation chapter 3. And he said, I have the key of David. And what I open, no man will shut. And what I shut, no man will open. He opens up the doors. Come on, governmental doors financial doors, relational doors, resources that you haven't even prayed for yet. He opens up the doors. My God, I feel that. Isaiah chapter 45. <laughs> like it or not, we seem to be in a Cyrus season. Okay, well, don't everybody shout. Verse one says, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors. Whoa. You see it? To open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. Whew. Pastor Kilpatrick always taught me both publicly and privately. If darkness has any treasure, if darkness has any riches, God didn't bless them with it. Come on, y'all. God ain't blessing the devil. If darkness has riches, it's because they stole it. How many know it's time? These doors are opening up and the things that the devil has stolen, he's going to have to cough it up. I told you earlier, if you catch a thief stealing, he's got to pay it back double. And in some cases, up to seven times. Some of y'all need to get a piece of paper, write down what the devil stole and take it to the high court of heaven and say, I want a ruling. I want a recompense in my favor. I didn't pick this fight. I didn't start this trouble, but bless God, I'm going to finish it because the doors are opening up and the devil's got to cough it up. Now that we're in central Florida, we go to Jim Rayleigh's church. Don't y'all wish I could pick some good pastors? He thinks he's black too. <laughs> that seems to be a recurring theme in my life. At the beginning of 2017, he said, this is the season of supernatural expansion. I feel that in here right now. This is the season of supernatural expansion. And he said, this is your double door season. Well, when that hit in the room, that sounds good, but I don't necessarily shout just because it sounds good. Do you understand? I've heard a lot of churchy things. But that Sunday morning, I felt the power of God hit me on the front row of that church. And I thought, I don't understand this word, but I just took something home with me. Like, you know, you know what I'm talking about? How many have had God do something so big in you that you knew it was going to be in layers having to process that, right? Better get ready because this is that kind of weekend. You're not going to wake up tomorrow morning and have all this figured out. It's going to take some process. That's okay. Well, we, we had, when we moved to our house... We moved so fast that we didn't get everything done straight away, partially because I was pregnant with Malachi and pregnant people don't need to smell paint because that makes them throw up and it was just not pretty. So, and we had to take authority over the pea green walls in our house because I don't know, the 90s threw up on our house. So we had to get in there and cast that thing out. So Nathan was at work one day and Malachi went down for a nap. It's amazing what I can do in an hour and a half. I'm like a white tornado in that house, man. So I'm painting and there's, we live in the middle of nowhere. We did it on purpose. Perhaps we have a little redneck in us. Just being honest. We live in the country. We have a very long driveway, dirt road. Okay. 
We're by ourselves. Me, Malachi's down for his nap, and I have a cocker spaniel. She's more Pentecostal than some of y'all. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. I go, Lucy, let the Lord touch you, and she falls out. It's great. <laughs> but nobody's home, and you don't come anywhere near my house unless you meant to, because we just like the peace and quiet of the country. We did that on purpose. We travel enough that we like the solitude of that. So. There's no traffic, it's just chilled out, it's just me. Our house has no trees surrounding it. Come on, Florida and hurricanes, you don't want no branches. Just being honest. So our, there's nothing around our house that anybody could have hidden behind. I'm telling you this because I had an experience in my home that absolutely changed my life. I told you I don't like fake things, but I do like real things and I will not back off from the real supernatural. Because just in case you don't know, if you go to the young adults reading section at Target, it's all supernatural. It's all demonic. But every bit of it is supernatural. So I'm not ashamed of the real Holy Ghost. I'm not going to get Care Bears and Smurfs with you. But when the Lord shows up, we're not ashamed of how he moves. And we're not a little bit embarrassed about what he does. Okay? So I'm in my house and, and I'm just, I'm hanging out with Jesus while I'm throwing some paint on the walls. And I, I, my phone rang, so I thought, well, I got to put the paintbrush down because I have no ability to talk on the phone and stand still. Isn't that a shock? Everybody said I'd grow out of my hyperactivity, but I'm almost 34. I think the ship sailed. But when my phone rang, I decided to go check the mail. So I walked down this long dirt road to the mailbox my dog came with me. She's totally at peace because she is, she thinks she's a Rottweiler. She thought I was in danger. She goes crazy. Come back up to the house, walk back in. The dog's at peace. Malachi has not stirred. I walk into my living room. I had just been hanging out with Jesus, just marinating in that word. This is the double door season, season of supernatural expansion. We'd been saying yes to it without understanding it because God's not logical. And he doesn't need me to understand it to say yes to it. Come on, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not understand it. Trust in the Lord. And don't lean to what you do think you understand. Okay. Walk into my living room. You don't have to believe me because I know I'm telling the truth. And I will sleep tonight because I know I'm telling you the truth. I fear God too much to make stuff up for you. I walked into my living room. I felt the presence of God immediately. I mean, it's like the chills all over my arms. Walked into that room and the double doors that lead to my back patio, they were wide open. They had been both locked and deadbolted. And I was like, oh my God. I will never forget it as long as I live. I walked up and I nearly, I nearly lost it. Because when I walked up to that door, Pastor Kim, it was, it's one of those doors that it latches top, bottom, right? Also has a deadbolt, also has a lock. Okay, the latch door was totally blown open. When we just had Hurricane Irma in September, that didn't blow it open. To give you some idea. And the deadbolt door, it was open and the deadbolt was still in the locked position. Y'all, that's one thing when you get a word from your pastor... It's another thing when God starts demonstrating it in your living room. It's like I could hear the Holy Ghost saying, I open up the doors that no man can shut. I got, I got a, I'm just being real. I, this, I am a Monday morning kind of Christian. Okay. This is, I'm just real. I got, Nathan had been working. We'd been laying a new floor because with the pea green walls came old lady carpet that smelled like somebody's dead dog. He'd been ripping up the carpet and putting down new flooring. And there was one of those really big hammers that had the, I don't know, the different end on it. I'm so not <laughs> DIY. Okay. <laughs> All I can do is paint. The rest of it's up to Nathan. I got that big old hammer and I went through every room in my house. Because I thought it's, it's my baby in that bed in yonder. And if somebody came up in this house, they're going to leave with a hammer in their head. But the peace of God was all over that house. 
and those scriptures, I open up to you the double doors. And it, here's what's coming through the double doors. The hidden riches of secret places, the treasures of darkness, the things that hell has stolen. Come on, your prodigal sons and daughters. This is, I'm announcing it to Arizona today, not just to this church or just to this city, although it's included, but to this whole state, I'm announcing to you, this is your double door season. This is the season of supernatural expansion. My God is the door opener and he's opening up the doors that no man can shut. I don't care who else quit on God in the past in this state. I don't care how many churches, and I don't know anything. I don't care how many churches decided that they would rather be normal than to host a move of God. This is your double door season. Souls are coming through the doors. Harvest is coming through the doors. Signs and wonders and miracles are coming through the doors. He opens up the doors that no man can shut. And he's good at it. Oh, my, 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 my. What I wouldn't give to see what happens in here in about six to nine months. You better get ready. Because when these doors fly open, people that you... (laughs) Don't get mad at me, people that have left this church and you weren't sorry to see them go. They're going to come back and you better get ready to give them a hug because God's bringing back human resources into this church. You understand that sometimes the devil doesn't just steal your money. Sometimes he steals the person that was going to have the idea that was a God idea to set you into your next season. You better get ready. They're coming. They're coming. I'm telling you, they're coming perpetual irrevocable well those of you that hadn't stood up yet can go ahead and stand and worship team if you want to come I'm going to quit Jesus said I have the key of David and what I open no man can shut now some of y'all he also said (laughs) I shut the doors that no man can open. And some of y'all need him to put a period at the end of the sentence. Some of y'all need some doors to shut so you can move into your next thing. Don't worry. He's got that too. The God I serve is the chain breaker. He breaks every chain. (laughs) Doesn't matter how they got there. Your fault, the devil's fault, your mama's fault. It just doesn't matter. He's the chain breaker. He's the way maker. He is going to get creative in this church. And in this region, and he's going to begin to make a way. He's going to override the logistics that you think you've come up with. And he's going to mess you up. I see blueprints. I see blueprints. I see blueprints. I see blueprints. There is a new thing coming. This isn't big enough. Even that's not big enough. I see blueprints. You said you wanted to be a territory taker. What do you think that means? I see schools. I see schools. I see schools. I see worship cultivation. Direction being given because it's way too rare to have worship like this. You understand this ain't everywhere. I see schools where the DNA of revival is imprinted on the next generation. Legacy! Perpetual and irrevocable. But you better get ready, Jess. Y'all be careful not to classify or categorize her in the next season. Be very careful. That's not just the worship leader.
There is something on you that slips over into prayer and it's effortless and it's normal. Don't ever let anybody intimidate you about that. Don't ever stop flowing in that because as much as this is a worship team, this is an army of intercessors and that is okay. If you needed it, you really don't. But if you needed permission for that to be okay from somebody, consider yourself granted. It is okay to be who you are. And in the next season, when the Lord starts dealing with you about perpetual prayer, you let it come. Don't worry. God's got this worship under control. It wasn't your idea in the first place. He's got it perpetual and irrevocable. Oh my God, my God, my God. Don't classify. Don't categorize. One of the best things that happened to me was when my pigeonhole blew up. Now I'm not Lydia the worship leader and I'm not Lydia the preacher. I'm just Lydia and I serve how I need to and it's all good. I don't need a title or a business card. I'm having more fun than y'all. Don't classify her. Could we lift our hands and pray in the Holy Ghost for a minute? You know, the Bible says when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you build yourself up in the most holy faith. For just a moment, pray in the Holy Ghost. I want that couple from Washington State. Y'all come here real quick. Come on, church. Pray with me. Pray with me. Pray with me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, let's cooperate with the Holy Ghost in here. The Lord said he's opening your ears. You're going to hear his voice with great clarity. You're going to have boldness that's not normal to your personality. And the Lord says, I will amplify your voice. Speak. Ha. In the mighty name of Jesus. Speak the word of the Lord with great clarity, with great boldness. I speak that the tiredness from the last season come off of your life. Like the layers of an onion. Refreshing that goes deep. Wisdom that flows effortlessly. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on church, pray, pray, pray. Pray, pray, pray. Yeah, 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 yeah. Under Armour hoodie boy, come here. I'm sure your name is way better than that. Come on, lift your hands. Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. Hey, 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 hey. Holy Ghost, flow like a river. Don't wait until your 20s to do what God has put on your heart. You're hearing and you're in it. Walk it out. You're going to be a sign and a wonder. Speak! Speak! I rebuke arthritis in the name of Jesus. I rebuke it right now. Start moving your joints. Start moving your joints. Do do something you couldn't do. Come on, faith is now. Healing is now. Who says you gotta wait till tonight? Today's a good day to get healed. don't want to embarrass anybody but whoever it is that's been dealing with barrenness I want to pray for you is it you baby come on church pray with me God in Jesus name I rebuke the stigma of barrenness. I rebuke barrenness itself. And I command him to get off of this life in the name of Jesus. I speak to this womb in the name of Jesus. Resurrection life. Hey. 
Many are the children of the barren in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God, what you did for my family right now as a steward of that miracle, I release it. I release it to this family right now. Barrenness, you have to go. You have to bow to the name of Jesus. New life, new life, new life. New joy, new joy, new joy. In the name of Jesus, you're doing it, Holy Ghost. We give you praise. You're doing it right now.